love to give us your mercy. That you love to not give us what we deserve, but you prefer to give us the things that we don't deserve. Help us to truly understand mercy today. Teach us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So we need to first of all understand that mercy is an attribute of God. What is mercy? You see a kid on the side of the road and you pick it up because you, you don't want it to starve to death? Is that, is that mercy? I suppose that's mercy. I mean, you're, you're being kind to somebody. But what mercy really means is to pity or to be compassionate. You know, if, if God didn't have mercy, we'd all be dead because we're all deserving of judgment. I think really mercy is a pretty easy thing to understand because we all ask for it, right? When we blow it, what do we want? We want mercy. When somebody else blows it, well, what do we want to give them? Judgment. <laughs> well, see, God doesn't think about it that way. God wants to give us mercy, not give us what we deserve. By the way, mercy is kind of the flip side of grace. I mean, you can't hardly say one without saying the other. Mercy is not getting what you, not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And that's just the nature of God. He, 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 we are backwards. We think we think linearly, but we don't. We're backwards. God does it right. He gives mercy when you don't deserve mercy. He gives grace when you don't deserve grace. And every one of us has been shown God's mercy. And that mercy is incredibly great. I, uh, I love what David said about God's mercy. You know, David, God... The only guy in the Bible that God said was a man after his own heart was David. David, I think, I, I didn't, I've never interpreted that to mean that David's heart was the heart of God. I think David chased after the heart of God. He was after God's heart. He wanted to know God. He, he, he saw God's mercies. He saw God's grace. And he just chased him. Remember, later in uh, David's kingdom, he wanted to do this crazy thing. In 2 Samuel, he wanted to take a census of all the fighting men in Israel. Remember that story? You know, it, it didn't seem to be really relevant. It's like, what? all of a sudden, why is this guy who's been a successful king all his life, God's blessed him for almost 40 years as king, and now, instead of relying on God, he wants to rely on the number of fighting men that he has. I mean, the Bible doesn't really say that was his motivation for taking the census, but you kind of get the impression that's what... He wanted to see. He wanted to see how great his army was. And you can't help but to wonder why. I mean, was, was it because he wanted to gloat? Because he was proud? He wanted to show off, you know, the vastness of his army, the might of his army? Don't know. The Bible doesn't really say. But it kind of intimates that later on because it says that once he did that, David was convicted in his heart about it. And, it, it, uh, you know, he, it, he had already known God took care of him when the bear came. He grabbed him by the beard, clubbed him in the head. God took care of him when the lion came. He grabbed him by the beard, clubbed him in the head. He, he killed a nine-foot-tall seasoned warrior with a stone and a sling. And all of his life he had relied on God. This time, for whatever reason, it didn't seem that he was doing that. And it didn't please God either. David recognized it. He said, I've sinned greatly in what I've done. So he prayed for forgiveness, admitting that what he had done was foolish. And the next day, the Lord spoke to him through the prophet Gad and told David, because of what he had done, because of these sins, God was going to give him one of three choices. He said, I'm going to give you seven years of famine, fleeing for three months before his enemy, or three days of plague. Now, you know, it's like, Lord, is, is there a box number four? Because <laughs> none of those are desirable. But you know what David
So he picks three days of plague, and the Lord sent the angel, and the angel's decimating Israel. And when the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord finally relented, and he stayed the angel's hand. He was merciful. Remember when David had the adulterous affair with Bathsheba? That's a whole story all in itself. But Bathsheba was another man's wife. In fact, Uriah was one of his 30... If you, if you read in, in, in the Kings, in the, the Kings it talks about the, the, the 30 mighty men, mighty men of David. Uriah was one of them. One of his closest friends. But he... But he slept with uh, Uriah's wife and then he had Uriah put in a position in the war where he would actually be killed. Bathsheba gets pregnant because of that trist. And the Lord was angry with David. So the baby gets sick. And the baby's sick to death. Bathsheba has the baby and the baby becomes deathly ill. When David found out about it, David laid on his face all night pleading to the Lord for his mercies. Now, the child ultimately died. Now, David, you know, laying there in, you know, in you know, ashes and, and, and burlap, that's the way they, you know, showed their contrition. He laid there all day pleading to the Lord. But when the, when the baby t finally died, David got up, he washed himself, he ate, he worshiped the Lord. And when his servants asked him why, why he was so contrite when the child was sick, and then he got up and did his normal activities and washed himself and ate after the Lord died, here's what David said. In 2 Samuel 12, 22, he said, And he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? See, David was convinced that there was nothing he had done that was right, but he knew the heart of God, and that the Lord, he knew, could and would show mercy. Now, in this instance, the child died, but that's not the end of the story. Obviously, Bathsheba was bereaved, right? She's the mother. No mother wants to lose a child. David comforted her, and the Lord blessed her, and she was able to conceive, and she conceived a child by the name of Solomon. And the Bible tells us that God loved the child Solomon. See, God was, God was merciful. There was still judgment there, but God in his mercy still gave them a child. And Solomon ended up being the wisest king that's ever, the wisest man that's ever lived. God is, David knew that God was full of mercy. Now, we don't always know how that mercy comes, but we know in our Christian life, mercy comes straight through to us through Jesus Christ. And that mercy is complete. Consider what James said about mercy. In James chapter 2, 8 through 13, it says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What James is saying here, James is actually making a distinction between the, the, uh, the containment of the law, the judgment of the law, and the mercy that comes through us under the new covenant, under grace. See, if God just if God, if God destroyed every one of us, he would be justified in doing so, wouldn't he? We all sin and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. We all deserve death. And, and, and people go, well, wait a minute. I mean, I, I haven't committed a sin that's worth death. People don't understand the nature of sin. Sin is a rejection of life. God's life. Rejecting God is choosing not life. So it only makes sense then the wages of sin is death because if you don't choose life, the only thing that remains is death. See, people don't understand that. That's why it's difficult to comprehend this concept that the wages of sin is death. If we choose to disobey God, what we have chosen is death. It's that simple. But what... 
But what James is talking about here, he's contrasting the Old Covenant with the New. The Old Covenant, we call it the royal law or the, or the law, was what we call an if-then covenant. It was a conditional covenant. If you do this, blessings will follow. If you do not do this, curses will follow. It was if-then. It was contingent. You had a promisor. You had a promisee. The promisor would give if the promisee did what he was supposed to do. So both sides had to, had to, had to, had to be active. And what, what a lot of people don't understand about the law, and we've, you know, we, we teach about this all the time because the church needs to hear this all the time. The law was not given to be kept. Wait a minute. The Bible says, the law says don't commit murder. You mean that's okay to murder? No, that's not what I mean. What I mean is what Jesus explained later on about the law. He says the law says if you kill somebody, you committed murder. But what I say is if you look on a brother with hate in your heart, you're at risk of judgment. If you sleep with another person's spouse, you've committed adultery. But what I say is if you look on someone else and lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. What is he saying? The law was not made to be kept because our hearts are corrupt. The law shows the absolute perfection of God and leads us to a need for a Savior to reconcile us to that perfect God because we cannot reconcile ourselves because of our fallen nature. We are replete with sin. So the law was given to show us our need for, for a Redeemer. The law is perfectly exacting, and it's incredibly diagnostic. It shows you when you've blown it, but it has no curative effect. You know, x-ray can show you you've got a broken arm, but it doesn't set the broken arm, does it? No. No, you need treatment for that. That's what grace does, but grace and mercy. Grace changes our heart. The law shows us that we need a change in our heart. There's no, there's no wiggle room in the law. To break even one small aspect of the law was to break the whole law and fall under its judgment. In fact, Paul even put it this way in Romans 2. He said, the one who lives by the law will be judged by the law. The law says if you, if you break the law, then you sin. You, the wages of sin is death. One slip, it's over under the law. But see, James contrasts the royal law with the law of liberty. See, the, the word liberty here literally means freedom from slavery. The law of liberty came about because of God's judgment? No. His mercy. He knew there's nothing we could do about making ourselves holy before Him, pure before Him, acceptable before Him. We deserve death, but rather than Him giving us judgment, He did give judgment but not to us. He came, he incarnated as a man, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ lives a perfect life. He dies for us, sheds his blood for us, pays our sin debt so that God can exact perfect justice in the body of Jesus Christ and at the same time show us perfect mercy, not giving us what we deserve because he took on that burden himself. He took on that payment himself. He paid the price for our sins so we would not fall under the judgment of sin. So, he purchased us with his blood from the slavery of sin to be slaves of righteousness. Now, that sounds like an oxymoron. How can you be a slave of righteousness? I mean, the concept of righteousness is that we're right, we have right standing with God. We walk in this law of liberty. We're not bound anymore. And that's what he's pointing at. He's saying... You, you, you are so set free, you're actually slaves to freedom. He set us completely free. And by the way, we've talked about this before. I want you to understand something. We don't live in a culture of slavery, so we don't really understand it. But when you review history, most slaves didn't want to be a slave. They didn't want to be owned by somebody. They didn't want to be told what to do and when to do it, and when to eat and when not to eat, when to sleep and not to sleep. Whether, but whether they were good at it or whether they liked it or not didn't make a difference. They were still slaves. So it wasn't their attitude that made them a slave. It was their state. When Jesus set us free, he set us free to be slave, slaves of righteousness. Do you know that 
We are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could be the righteousness of God. So we're righteous. Even when we don't feel righteous. Because our feelings have nothing to do with it. Our attitude has nothing to do with it. Whether we like it or not, we have nothing to do with it. It is the state that we are in when we're in Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? So I can wake up in a mood that doesn't you maybe reflect a, a, a Christian attitude. But it doesn't change my state if I'm in Christ. Do y'all wake up in different moods? Yeah. Well, if God based this on mood, none of us would think we were saved. <laughs> he made us slaves to righteousness. You know what he did? He did that by purchasing us with his blood. He sets us free. He exercises perfect justice and at the same time shows perfect mercy. It's the most incredible thing. So James is saying to conduct ourselves as God, God conducted himself. How? By showing mercy. We're supposed to show mercy to people. Why? Because we've been shown mercy. Not giving people what they deserve. This is, this is where two or three lessons just on the concept of forgiveness. So these things go hand in hand. Mercy and forgiveness are flip sides of the same coin. Jesus talks a little bit about this concept in Matthew 7. He said, judge not and be not judged, for with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. What does that mean? He didn't say don't judge. He said, don't judge lest you be judged. So he's saying, look, if you want to be judged, then you need to be aware you are going to be judged with the same measuring stick that you're judging with. So if you know you can judge that way, it's not bad to judge. We can't, so we shouldn't. <laughs> right? We judge, with a, we judge ourselves with a yardstick of mercy, and we judge others with the one-inch-long ruler of justice. <laughs> James makes a salient point. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The judgment we deserve, frankly, guys, would have killed us. But it shows God's righteousness. See, the Bible tells us he's both the just and the justifier. He was just in condemning us to sin, but he died for us instead. And that, in his eyes, was justice because our sin debt was paid. So what he did was just, and what he did, because he did it, makes him the justifier of us. God himself justified us. He's the just and the justifier. So out of that, it would spawn the church and the body of Christ. And just keep this in mind. Mercy, you know, judgment is death. Mercy is life. I mentioned that you know, it goes hand in hand with forgiveness. Forgiveness basically means there is a debt owed in your ledger. Somebody owes you a debt, and they need to pay it. Forgiveness is basically saying, I choose not to collect the debt. I wipe your slate clean. We'll talk about that more in a minute. There's a parable that Jesus used. It's kind of long here, but it really probably, from my perspective, is the single best parable in the Bible about the concept of mercy and forgiveness. In Matthew 18, 23 through 35, Matthew wrote this parable that Jesus recited. He said, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the, the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, 
They were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, saying to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. I'm going to unpack this a little bit because that's a long parable. But there's a few observations we'd make at the beginning. There's no doubt the debt was owed to either, to either creditors, right? Nobody questioned that the debt was actually owed. I mean, I think we need to understand that a lot of people don't even understand that they have a sin debt that Jesus paid that they can accept if they receive him. They need to understand being as good as the next guy isn't enough because everybody sins. And the master had the authority to collect the debt. Both of these creditors had the authority to collect the debt. Both of them under that culture could have thrown the, the debtor in jail, had sold them as slaves to pay the debt. That was the culture. But look at the contrast in the amount of the debt. A talent is 75 pounds. I did a little survey one time of just all the, 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 just the incredible number of talents of gold that David alone had contributed for the building of the temple. And it was something on the order of like $200 billion. I mean, in today's prices, an ounce of gold is about $2,000 an ounce. That makes 75 pounds a talent worth in gold about $2.4 million. This guy owed 75 talents, 75 pounds of gold. I call that a lot of money. Actually, it's about $24 billion. A denarii, so that's kind of an unpayable debt, isn't it? If you owe 20, you, you know, if you owe, <laughs> if you owe somebody $24 million, you just bankrupt FXT, right? Or whatever that company was, the, 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 the coin thing. What do they call that? Bit, yeah, crypt, yeah, crypto coin, right. Bitcoin. Big, big amount of money. You know what a denarii was? Day's wage. So in today's parlance, they say that, you know, your average is $15 an hour. A hundred denarii would be the equivalent of about $12,000. $12,000 compared to $24 billion. I mean, that's like a speck in the ocean, isn't it? Comparatively speaking. But both debts were owed. Both debts were owed. I mean, one debt was such that we couldn't even get our mind around it. The other one was going, okay, it's kind of high. $12,000 is a lot of money, but it's a debt that you could arguably pay. I think the reason that Jesus used such drastically contrasting numbers is he wanted us to understand that mercy and forgiveness is priceless. How do you forgive somebody $24 billion in debt? You obviously have mercy, unless you're being bribed, unless they got the goods on you. The only way that I can imagine that anybody would ever just be forgiven because of mercy is mercy. I mean, but for a debt like that is because of mercy. That's what it says here. The guy pled that the master be patient, and the master was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the entire debt, $24 billion. That was obviously exponentially more than what the, the debtor was owed by the other guy, right? Note what happened here. That the difference is not lost on the king. How could you not forgive such a small debt when I gave, forgave such a big debt? And the king was angry with him. And he turned him over to the jailers. And here's the key to the story about forgiveness. He was tortured until he paid all that he owed. You know what unforgiveness does? It's like torture. It's a burden and it gets bigger and grows and grows and grows. And it's like a canker to your soul. And it can make 
someone who is unforgivable, somebody who is unforgiving, rot in their flesh. It can destroy lives. People are tortured. You know, when they think about somebody who, who owes them a debt in their mind, somebody they cannot forgive, they can't think of a single good thing about them because the only thing they can think about when they think about that person is the debt that's owed. So forgiveness is actually intended for both parties' well-being. I forgive because I don't want to be tortured by unforgiveness and bitterness. Didn't Paul say that? Don't let a root of bitterness spring up. Where does that come from? Unforgiveness. And here's the thing that I think sometimes that, that we miss. Remember I told you at the beginning, some people don't realize that they have a debt. What Jesus is saying here is the debt you owe God is unpayable by you. That's how vast it is. How much he's forgiven us is exponentially more than we could ever pay back. So the debt that you may owe me and the forgiveness that I owe you may be a lot, but it'll never compare to the forgiveness that God gave me. And that's what he's making this drastic comparison of a contrast about. He wants us to understand we have been given, forgiven far more than we would ever be able to forgive others. I mean, what he did was he, 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 we were condemned to death and, and instead of putting us to death, he came and died for us. That's incredible. And then he forgave us because he died for us. And there's something else about forgiveness too that I think is really important to remember. And I think this is, this is where the high center is on a lot of people struggling with forgiveness. They think that in order to forgive, you have to forget. But you know what? You can have a debt in your ledger and it be wiped out. But you can remember it. Forgiveness is not forgetfulness. Forgiveness is, I know you had this debt, but I'm not going to hold it against you anymore. You no longer owe me this debt. Do I remember that? Sure, but that's not unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is, I do remember, but I'm still not going to hold it against you. Now, the Bible says that God takes our sins. He throws them as far as the east is from the west. Uh, he throws them into the sea of forgetfulness and remembers them no more. He chooses not to remember. That doesn't mean that he can't. And I think that sometimes, you know, we, we find ourselves thinking we've forgiven somebody, and the moment something comes up that makes us remember that, we start feeling kind of old grudges and everything, and so we think maybe we haven't forgiven them. Maybe we haven't if we act on those grudges that grudging feeling but if we feel that and remind ourselves that we have forgiven them and we're not going to hold it against them then we can say we've truly forgiven well guys here's the good news god abounds in mercy psalms 103 8 through 10 says the lord is merciful and gracious he, he, he doesn't give us what we do deserve, and he gives us what we don't. Merciful and gracious. Merciful and gracious. Both sides, same coin. Slow to anger and abounding in mercy. See, there's mercy again. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep us his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. If we really understood the magnitude of our sins, we would realize there is no way we've been punished for them. Even though sometimes we may face consequences for certain sins, that is not by any stretch the judgment that that sin deserves. He's merciful. I love Psalms 103, 3. It says, If you, Lord should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? In other words, if you held men's sins against them, who could stand? But there's forgiveness with you that you may be feared. God abounds in mercy because he wants people to recognize him, recognize that he is merciful, and serve him, and come to him for his mercies. God doesn't mind us saying, Lord, be merciful to me. You know what he says in return? I have been. You have Jesus. That's the pinnacle. He is the pinnacle of mercy. See, the Lord remembers how we're made. He remembers how fallible we are. 
I mean, he's already had to destroy the earth one time because of the stiff-neckedness and the you know, absolute rebellion of man. He knows, who, he knows how we're made. And he, he remembers our predilection for sin. He remembers that we're weak. It was his mercy that stayed his hand of judgment and sent his son to die for us. Just mercy. And it was his abounding mercy that compelled him to do that. And that mercy, he saved us. That is what we're to show others. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your mercy. Um, they endure forever. And we are so grateful for your graciousness to us. We are so in awe of the things that you have forgiven us for and even the things we don't recognize that you've forgiven us for. Help us to experience that love of God that's shed abroad in our hearts so when we look at others, especially those who offend us, that we will show mercy and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.